Here at Heart of Glass, the podcast, we want to make this the safest listening and viewing experience for everyone. So that being said, today's conversation mentions suicidal ideations, drug usage, and heavy alcohol usage. So if you're sensitive to any of these topics, we've put the minute markers in the description below. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome back to Heart of Glass, the podcast. My name is Ashley Cohn and I'm your host and we are so happy to have you tuning in, whether it's through one of our video streaming formats or through audio. Today, like usual, we are filming right here at Toledo Spirits and they are one of our amazing sponsors. And if you have not had a chance yet to try their Heart of Glass vodka, please give it a try. It is basically like drinking strawberry jam. It's delicious, it goes with just about anything and even if that's not your jam, they have uh, literally your jam. They have several other amazing liquors to try, so give them a shot. They are a Toledo-based and owned business, and they're wonderful. They've been wonderful to us. Today's guest is Toledo born and raised and a full-time recording and visual artist. His name is synonymous with the Glass City music scene, and one of our recent guests described him as a true renaissance man. His songs have been placed in several films throughout the years, including his song, Tonight I Got You, which was featured in the 2020 major motion picture, Triumph. I was privileged to co-write a song with him for my first album, and I'm excited to dig into what makes him who he is today. So Glass City <laughs> Humans, I give you Mr. Jeff Stewart. How are you, Jeff? Hi, Ashley. It is so good to see it's you. It's great to be here with you. Honey. I'm so excited to talk to you. We always get these excited moments when we share moments together. I know. So, yeah, let's talk about something. I know. I was thinking about this coming up and was like already looking forward to it because I feel like anytime we've gotten to talk for an extended period of time, it kind of just feels like a big warm hug. And I always walk away from it feeling better than, than when I came into it. I always see you, see you at random parts where I'm like, so I probably random. could use that. And then I go <laughs> and like, oh, better that things are better yeah i feel like you and i have had a few moments where we we've gone oh my goodness probably months sometimes a, a year with, with yeah. the pandemic without seeing each other and i feel like it's kind of those perfectly timed universe moments where one of us is just needing that hug or just a that that smile and and yeah you've always, you you've always that. been that you can't me. deny that kind of stuff i know you? it's amazing yeah. hey, right cheers babes. cheers absolutely well i'm excited to dig into this with you. When we were texting over the weekend about this, yeah. um, you said that you feel like you need to shed some skin and reinvent yourself. And I am I am thrilled that you view this format as an opportunity to do that. My question is mm. that I'm just simply curious to know what is making you feel compelled <clears throat> to do that. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it's an overnight decision to think about things like that. I think just getting on you know, you're, uh, the young guns are coming up and yeah. it's not about that. It's about staying, you know, I've, every day I, I write and I'm working on my music and art and everything. And sometimes the isolation of that, you feel like you're, you're maybe forgotten about because I don't have my social media presence is not as near as what I could be, you know, yeah. that's not what I try to focus on during the day that then it gets, it adds up. And sometimes you feel forgotten a little bit, but not in like a poor me way, but more like a, oh man, I feel like I really need to. I want to get out of this. I want to move. I want to. Sh I want people to see what the hell I'm doing. Sometimes more than it happens, yeah. you know. And um, I think as we get older, I'm feeling healthier. I'm feeling better. I started. You know, we'll talk about that stuff. But just tired of being. I'm tired. You look at old pictures a lot. Yeah. You know, this is hard to articulate. I hadn't thought about this, but you know, just the old pictures are nice over there. But now here we are in the present. So it's time to maybe. Um, you know, I'm in my fifties now. So let's see what this let's see what this brings. I get what you're saying. There's there's an element of consistency and ever presence that's always wonderful. And the nostalgia aspect is always a good thing, especially when it's someone like you who's been a part of this community their entire life and added so much to the art and music scene. At the same time, I know what you're saying because even with this with us, 
Social media is such a key part of marketing yourself and there there's an algorithm to it. And I, I know it's it has to be extremely different than when you first got into this whole art and music scene for how, how you get yourself out there and you, you tell the story of who you are. It's funny, I can't believe, like, if I had social media when I was a kid, yeah, yeah, I just can't imagine what I would be going out there, you know, all work, but also just thoughts and stuff. And now sure. that I kind of like come out of the um, more reserved or more refined sp space in my life, now it's like, now that I am settled in, uh, social media is sort of like a uh, a necessary evil or something. You know, yes. I like to be. I like, you know, I, I put away all the. I don't like to talk about the politics and stuff out mm -hmm. there. I feel like the best thing I can do, my presence is just to show good things and hopefully the good side of things, even, you know, the smiles and stuff, because there's just enough crap out there. You Absolutely. Know, if you want to hear me yell at the, the angry old guys and the old uh, politicians, you know, follow me on Twitter. Right. But don't, don't, <laughs> don't, you know, it's it's uh, it's something how it, it takes you. Uh, it's funny, I have moments yeah. where you take a picture with somebody and then, then two months go by and you don't share that moment. And then I'll think about that stuff. You know, real life happens and nobody sees it. So you're like, you're missing, you feel like you're not sharing enough. You feel like yeah. you're not, and then you feel like, well, you're being mysterious. No, you're you're not sharing and people need to see that. And I think that's what I think when I feel left behind, I think sometimes, because then you can get more isolated and then you don't share. It, it yeah. becomes a thing, it becomes a thing. And then that thing becomes, another list, I gotta do this, and it becomes another thing. Absolutely. I don't know. Well, I'm excited to give a really good, well-rounded look at who you are, because you know this as much as I do. We have people in our lives who we both know and don't know, who sometimes only know us from one avenue, and that's literally <laughs> the only way that they see us, or they have an even outdated version yes. in their head of who we are. So I'm excited to help you shed that skin Thank a little you. bit and also help people get to know you, even some that have known you for years, just get to know you in a little bit deeper way. It's like shedding perceptions. Yes, exactly, you know. exactly. Maybe that's our next song. I would, yes. Well, we need, be we a, need to it'll write be a line some more in, anyway. It'll be a line during the second verse of something. Absolutely, yeah. shed your perceptions. perceptions. Yeah. I love it. All right, good. Well, you are Glass City born and raised. Yeah. So what did growing up here in the Glass City look like for you? Um, I grew up in a, in West Toledo, you know, um, my mom and dad divorced at, when I was about eight. It was definitely, a, I think, probably added some. Mm. Looking back, um, I know I was sad back then about that, and I didn't want my dad to leave the house, you know. So there was a lot of that kind of young, young trauma, if you will, I, I think. But um, as far as losing people, you know, even though my dad was in my life the whole time, uh, but I had a good, good childhood. We had three. My brothers and I, we, we, you know, we had a little, we had a team all the time. We could always come up with something to do. It wasn't boring. Nothing yeah. was ever boring. Had great friends in the neighborhood. And, you know, we didn't have much money, but I never knew what poor or rich was. You know, I thought yeah. if you, if you went on a boat and, and you're on a lake and had blueberries, that was like a, a was what rich people did or something. You know, my mom put three kids through um, through hockey all our lives. You know, from being a young kid to through high school. I don't know how she did it. Wow. I don't know how she did it. Um, but um, I had, I started playing music at a young age and, and uh, growing up around here was great. I think Toledo is a hard knock city. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot of traveling uh, here and there. And, and I think that you come back here and you get grounded. You know, if you can't get toughened up here, you can't. Your skin gets thick, you know? Absolutely. It's a hard drinking city. There's a lot That's of, true. It's a hard drinking city. I mean, the bars are open later than most cities, you know, and it, it adds to the, you know, if you're in the nightlife, like, you, you know, you and I have known for so many years. Yes, uh, yeah. It, it adds up as well. But my, growing up here was great. I had a great time, uh, you know, high school is high school. Sure. You know, just didn't care about schooling and all that, but went to college and got all my degrees and stuff. and. So what in, uh, what in your opinion, being somebody who was born and raised here is a quintessential part that is unique to growing up in Toledo, as opposed to possibly a bigger city or just any other city other than the Glass City? Well, we're the Midwest, so we think that we're number one here. <laughs> East Coast and West Coast, they think that they're the cultural, you know, start of it all, but you It's know, really us. We have our own Rust Belt <laughs> wave that spreads out. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know, what makes this different? Was the question, is that what it was? Yeah, what What do you feel like is a quintessential part of growing up here or, or just cities like Toledo that have such charm that are both small and big at the same time that you can't gain from growing up in a city that is not like ours. Our city gets beat down, you know, really and the, our, our, our state does, you know, some of our representatives are a little bit nutty, but that's another story. <laughs> um, I don't know, I think it was, it's humbling. I think that it, uh, I said it before, it's just it toughens you up, you know, you're not, yeah. uh, we had to earn what we have. We you know I had to work, I was, carrying paper, you know, I was delivering papers when I was 11 years old. I was a caddy at, caddy at Inverness. I was the little kid on Caddyshack, you know, carrying the big ass bag, you know. Oh, and, you I know, can totally picture a little Justin Yeah, I rode my, t my 10 speed, all the, you know, at 12 years old to Inverness, all the way from West Toledo and did that for a couple summers. And, you know, I think you just get to, you get used to earning your keep at a young mm -hmm. age. I think that's what a city like ours does where you know, we, we don't get stuff given to us. The stuff we do Ooh, yeah, now, that's true. we're very, um, we're, you know, we appreciate it more. So Definitely. getting getting what you um, what you earn is, is a sense of pride and, and also, um, you know, it, it makes you hustle more. If you want something, you can get it. Absolutely. I don't know. So what role did your parents have in helping to foster both your artistic and musical endeavors? Uh, you know, outside of turn it down, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> they were great. And my, my grandparents on my dad's side were both um, artists and they studied art. And um, so I know that they, I drew all the time when I was a kid. My bro, you know, that was yeah. one of the things that my mom would quiet us down with. I mean, she, not that I knew back at the time, but you know, I would be drawing and it would take up hours of my time between being a spastic kid outside, you know, running like a yeah. maniac. But so they facilitated me drawing. My mom got me my, she went and got me my guitar when I wanted to play my guitar when I first started at 11. She got me a guitar. She okay. got me a lesson. She got me an amplifier. She let me, my brothers play our guitars after school every day loud in my bedroom, you know, and, and never complained. She went to my gigs. She, you know, she'd probably rather have me be a, a, a doctor or lawyer back then or something, but you know, it, sure. she knew that that was, I was probably born into this situation, I guess. Musically, we were the first generation, my brothers and I, and oh, okay. family, and uh, first generation musicians. So I really wow. don't know where that came from. MTV days came on, and I was always into music. I never, I was always with, I always saw the culture end of things, you know, be from uh, talk shows or whatever, the Stones or the Beatles were on TV. I was always into that. I always checked that stuff okay. out. Okay, yeah. And, you know, uh, I knew what I, I knew I wanted to be a singer from when I was, you know, probably eight years old. That's what I was going to ask for you. Which came first, visual arts or music? Painting was just something that you just did or that you drew. Okay. I didn't really paint. I drew more so when I was sure. a kid, you know. And then, mm -hmm. as I got older, uh, my twenties, my thirties, really, people started encouraging. They saw some of my paintings, like, "Hey, man, well, it's pretty good. Why don't you put it up at a coffee shop?" And I did, and that's kind of where it all started. That's awesome. Um, and then music wise, um, help me actually with the question about that. To, to yeah, just, just which came first, art or music for you? Uh, so the art was always there and the music was more thought out because I had to take, go to the lessons and get, I had to practice okay. my guitar, that was work. I didn't want to practice, I just wanted to play. Okay. I wanted to you know, know the chords already and jam, but that, that that happens, but it's, you know, art, you can instantly go like this and draw something, you know, so that's almost instant gratification. So the music and art kind of always were together. It okay. was never separate. So they really can't answer that what came first kind of question. It was always together, uh, even today, you know, it's sure. there's art on my wall that I'm working on and there's songs that, that I'm working on. It's always that. Okay. So that's... they're separate and I wish sometimes that I could focus on just one thing. I think I probably, I think if I focused on one thing as opposed to being so all over the place, maybe things would be farther along. I don't know, but I, it's my pace. You yeah. know that game where you stick a quarter in the machine and like there's all those quarters and they're getting ready to go over yes. the edge? Yes, I do. I feel like I'm that. Everything keeps getting pushed over the edge and then you have to keep pushing those quarters over the other edges. And, um, I get I get the, the tendency to idealize it the whole mindset if I could just put my, all of my focus into one of them, 
I feel like though, because you are who you are, the fact that you are a multi-medium artist, even including music into one of those mediums, makes you who you are. And your each avenue of your art, whether it's visual or music, is so unique and so good that I feel like if you didn't have all those parts together, it just simply wouldn't be you. Thank you for shedding my own perception about myself for saying that. You're welcome, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So not placing more importance over one or the other, but just simply first focusing on Jeff Stewart, the visual artist, before we get to music. Considering the fact that you do work in multiple mediums, is there one that is most dear to your heart or more sacred that you hold above the others? Or do they all hold a special place in your heart in one way or another? I imagine it's like when people say, you know, you, all, you have all different kids. It's like, you're, you know, they're all your kids. Yeah. And so you have to take care of them all. That makes sense. You don't really have, uh, you know, there might be a brand new song in my brain that's going around that I, a spark of a new song that I'm constantly thinking about, or I want to get to this painting so I can knock this part out you know, oh man i got something here going on i get in but mostly it's all just kind of <laughs> sure running together there can looking at the idea of creativity breeding creativity yes in what way does your artistic side feed your musical side and vice versa you said an interesting thing about feeding creativity you know yeah. there's no more um downtime there's no more time to get writer's block or anything Creativity is fed by doing the work. So yeah. getting down to writing, to writing notes, to write, you know, which may be a song that you're crafting or just thoughts that might become later a song. Or just getting work to work. You can't always, you know, you're not just, an, I'm not always an abstract painter. There's stuff there just, you know, pouring paint and, you know, flaying it away in, yeah. in the moment of, of bliss. It's not like that. It's craft. Sure. So I'm working on something, you know, my painting is layers and layers and I'm building and so I have to paint the room three times in most cases to get the, the effect that I need. So, but that feeds the craft. It, when you're doing the work, there's when you're working. There's when the inspiration comes. You don't know that it's divine inspiration or whatever that means. You're just working. And the next thing you know, you're it just you're working more. You know, it's, sure. Uh, it's 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 a it helps perpetuate the art. It, it it becomes the craft is the work, and that becomes the inspiration for to keep it moving. That makes sense. It's kind of like kinetic energy, it where really where once you have something in motion, it wants to stay in motion, and almost has has a positive domino effect, where you're fostering <clears throat> one aspect of your creative endeavor, and then that in turn inspires you to work on your your other creative endeavor. <clears throat> if it doesn't, you're doing something wrong. Yeah, you absolutely. Waste I've done it before. You waste so much time feeling sorry for yourself and not working. Even if you have to grab your notebook, <clears throat> excuse me, just write, uh, it's 75 degrees and sunny today. I feel like shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> am I crazy? Or uh, I want, you know, just anything. It doesn't matter whether the dog is cute, you know? Yeah. You wrote something, didn't you? You know, and then when you're there at your notebook, then you can look back and, it, then stuff starts happening. That makes so, a lot of sense. It's better to make something happen and not, I don't like, there was that Kim Kardashian thing where she said a couple, you know, like a month ago, get off your ass. You know, you're like, she it's made people that weren't hustling and weren't millionaires or billionaires seem like they're lazy if they weren't hustling. It's like, it's not like that. You no, know, you not don't just, it's not the real world. You, um, well, hmm. and you, you strike me very recently. I, I had the opportunity to interview Ryan Roth and, um, Wonderful, yes, exactly. And that, that's actually who, um, in your intro, I, did, I was saying, described you as being a true Renaissance man. So there's a lot of mutual respect there. And um, he is one who very much is more focused on the journey rather than the destination and the yes. actual process of creating. And you also strike me that same way where obviously you appreciate the finished product but for you, the heart and soul is the whole process of creating and, and getting to that end point. That's just it. That's the whole thing. Ryan, first of all, just to shed some love back to Ryan. Yeah. He's um, he's an inspiration. You know, he's a true original, and he and I have actually been writing together. That's so wonderful. Getting, somehow, the strangest bedfellows make the you know a, a hell of a team. You know, and our, <laughs> our good friend Fish Fish, the three of us have a good thing going on. Um. The process, though, um, when you get done with the project, yeah, you get like this postpartum 
because you're done with it. You've yes, been working exactly. So much thought goes into the an album from the beginning of um, the song idea, the first song. You have to go down and you have to, okay, I'm doing something, but now I have to go facilitate this song. And that happens 10 times for the album, or probably 20 maybe, depends on how many you went on there, yeah. whatever you need. But then you have to write the song, you have to go to the studio, There's you have to play their instruments, you have to pay for the studio time. There's so many things that go into the production end of things, just from when the song spark, the process, then it goes to mixing, then it goes to mastering, then you have to get the thing printed, you have to do the artwork for it, and all that stuff. It's, an, it's a quite a, um, a process in terms of having to do all this stuff. Yeah. But the creative process, when you get, when, when you get when you get done with the album, you get it done, and you're like, oh, what now? Oh my God, are people liking it? You know, it's I spent all this time, and you know, do people care? Do people care about it? Because I cared about it so much. Right. I put every ounce of my care into this thing, this little thing, and that's out into the world, out of your control. So that stuff is like, okay, that's great. I don't need a bunch of uh, vanity trophies on my wall, you right. know, for that. So what gets me, what makes me feel most alive outside of being with my friends and my family is the creative process and doing the work, being with my mates in the studio when we're coming up together, whether it's a first idea of inspiration and, and plugging the guitars in and, and getting things going, running a scratch vocal and getting melodies going, to, you know, into to the long hours of wrenching on a mix, sitting right. there listening to the, that drum part 400 times in a row, you know, That's trying to dial that, it in. That's the part that people don't see too, is the hours and Constant. hours and hours of refining down and getting it to the point that <laughs> you know in your head it is supposed to be. Listening at home on different devices to, mm -hmm. to mixes and stuff in, but that's the work. That's yeah. what we love. That's what makes it, I want to. Get, I need to get back to the studio to do that again, you know, or they need to fix this or we need to do this. Uh, I love working, I love, I love working on projects. I love working with people together on projects. It fires me up. It makes me feel at, alive when I'm in the studio. Um, uh, the process of creating, like we were talking about before, how you, it, it, the, the work creates the work. Yes. So the, the process is that, it's always just that. And, and then coming up with a new idea, like even the little skulls, you know, and it's like, oh man, I get to, you're playing, you're being a kid in, in your own way, discovering just damn little piece of clay. Right. And now you have this, and now I want to make more. You are more something. Uh, process means so many things. Yeah, it means something different for, for every individual person. And I think that what's that's what makes creativity so incredible is that each process is uniquely tailored to each individual creator. There's so many different ways that when you read songwriting books or like who how these famous writers, you know, one guy gets up at eight in the morning every day. I'm not that guy that does that. I, yeah. My songs come with all the time, in different areas. You and I will be talking, We you know, we just had a, what was it, shedding, uh, yeah. whatever the heck. Shedding, sh the, shedding perceptions. That song, that'll be, that's work right there. I have to write that down now because I need to, I have to take care of that. I have yeah. to take care of that moment. If you don't take care of that moment, it's gone. That's true. And then you're not, you're not a working writer. If, yeah. if I didn't take that, if I don't write that down, I'll be like, what the hell did we talk about? Right. And and what, and, but if now I have this thing that can become a creative process and it can become something that we put out into the world. Absolutely. Done with that and move on to the next process. So let's talk about kind of the foundation <clears throat> of you becoming Jeff Stewart, the performer. So looking at your early 20s, looking at college, and the bands that you were in. So you were in a very popular band called The Flex and that was what you considered to be your first real band. And you put out an album with that group. And then after that, you formed The Starlings and released another album with that project as well. So what was it like for you to be a part of both those groups? And how did each of those groups help to influence who you are as a performer today? The Flex, we were 19, or I was 19 when we started. And so it was a college and we were all in college at UT, University of Toledo together. Um, we happened to get, we just hit it on the right. There's so many options today and there's so many things to, to see, but if you wanted to be part of something, you had to go out to do, actually do it before. So we had, we, had a, we had a scene and people came out in flocks to see us in the days. And uh, what came out of that was a relationship with these people that I still have 30 years later that wow. can still come and support me. 
So I didn't just put, I put time in with people as well, not just my own stuff, but I've made relationships that people support me. And um, we turned into um, the Starlings as a more, um, just wanted to play original shows as opposed to the Vienna the bar scene. And yeah. we, had, we had our album out and stuff. We played originals, but still you're, you know, you're jamming <clears throat> your cover tunes, which make, which form, you know, which form you, you know, inform you yeah. about how you're going to be different uh different angles of music inspirations but uh we wanted to become more original so we became the starlings uh and then um i was about 30 and went and then went through a divorce all that life changed and then i didn't want to go back to um i couldn't go back to anywhere that i was at in my 20s which uh i started um playing guitar, acoustic guitar more. And then I started okay. realizing that there was a whole, uh, there's a whole market for pe hungry people on patios. And so I just yes, started- Yes, there are, that's very true. I lost, I, in all my 20s after this divorce, you know, there was no more house, they lost, it was like sure. a country song, you know, a reverse, you know, lost the house and the wife, the dog right. and all this stuff. And knew that I was never gonna go back to that kind of life, meaning, I've always was in bands, and I was always playing and writing and putting out albums. But it, in my end, on my angle, it was a full, committed. You know, it wasn't just a dream. But I knew that I had to also facilitate this person that wasn't necessarily. Uh, she wanted me to do other things, you know, perhaps. Sure. And we're dear friends now. Okay. But back then, it just you know she wanted something different than I did. And then knowing that that was past me now, even though I didn't have any idea I was a train wreck to how to sure. move forward, I knew that I would never go back to that life of working shitty jobs uh, and being a, a part-time musician, you know, that was... It's hard for me to even picture you <clears throat> being in a normal nine to five corporate type, <laughs> type of grind, just because everything that I know about you as a person runs completely contrary to that, purely from how you like to go into your creative process where you don't... You don't have a defined, you know, I'm waking up at, at, at 7 a.m. At 8 o'clock, I sit down and I'm working on lyrics for an hour. At this point, I you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and then thinking about you talking with your uh, about your two bands and how you appreciate the relationships that you formed with them, that I'm almost wondering, is that kind of where you got that foundation of the people who you surround yourself with, especially in the music community being so important to you? Because I feel like even in, not just in conversation, but watching your social media activity, you are you are very, very quick to point out the people in your life that are important to you and that have been around you for a long time. I'm really lucky with friends and those relationships uh, endure today. Um, all those groups of friends that were in bands back then, we've all grown together and, and seen each other's families grow. Yeah. Um, we've jammed together, uh, we've made music together. <clears throat> um, you can't help but be uh, it's in, informed by that. You can't help but yeah. be informed by the people that were with you along those in those days, and you can't bullshit those people. They know That's who true. you. You know they know you for the for who you are. For better or for they, worse. Because they've worked long hours with you. Mm -hmm. It was just like a being in a relationship, but with five people or four Definitely. people. Definitely. You know, so <laughs> they, we all spent lots and lots of hours in sweaty. Re rehearsal spaces and uh, driving to gigs together and all this stuff so yeah. yeah well you you started to reference the relationships that you were in during that time period and like any good musician and artist worth their salt you've been through some significant heartbreak and you specifically referenced two relationships your your sweetheart that you met in college and then subsequently married and you, you used some very strong language because you said the ending of that destroyed you. So one, I'm interested to know how you coped with that after the fact, but then even more than that, you mentioned the next person that you were with and it sounds like it was a very tumultuous and um, very chaotic time, but you also said that this person saved you, so which, which your description of both of these very much lines up with a creative person and, and, and really being introspective and looking at how things have affected you. So looking at those two situations, how did you come out of those and how did they inform who you are as a person now? All our exes live in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? 
I better have a drink, drink before we get into this uh, part of the, uh, the conversation. <laughs> By the way, the sugar in here is making me cough. I don't is even. Much, I barely do have any sugar anymore. Okay. okay. So when I drink it, I can it instantly is a reaction. I can tell I'm been. Can I'm, you tell? No. Yeah. Can you, you can. Tell? You can tell. Wow. Monk fruit sweetener is my jam now. Is it? Yes. I have I'm not, not perfect I've not by had any that. means. By, not even close to perfection, but little things like that. Little that makes things. a big difference it for does, you. Indeed. So, um, yeah, uh, I was married to a Lebanese Italian girl, and I, we were college sweethearts at 21. Uh, I tr she used to come out and see me with her friends when I was in the band, and then I, had, we had a, you could, we were definitely crushing on each other. And I invented, invited her to uh, Rusty's Jazz Cafe because I told her I needed to get a class number, and we went to Rusty's and sat by the fireplace. Okay. And next thing you know, we're getting married at 26 years old, uh, had the house and all the stuff, and had a great, really great. We had great friends, great life. When it was good, it was great. And then yeah. we got to about 30 years old, and that's when I knew that I was going to be not living in the house anymore, where she was leaving me. That whole life that I had perceived for myself was gone. All that dependency on all that whole world and uh, my, my uh, status as a, you know, a married man. I mean, divorce is failure. You know, you lose all that. There's so many friends that, you know, cited. And you're 30, so you're still trying. You don't, man, you just don't know shit yet, you know. That is accurate. <laughs> so I moved in with my mom in my mom and stepdad's basement at the, the house I grew up in. Okay. <laughs> you know, now I used to play down in the basement. Now I'm sleeping down there on the couch. Got the, the utility room was my closet for about eight months. And, you know, I started oh. working at my buddy's landscaping in the morning, playing gigs at night, all night. You know, you still... Mm -hmm. Work until three, two, three in the morning, and then showing up in the morning. To, to, they wow. want you there at seven a.m. and you're like a zombie. Realized that that was that's after some time and after staying at my mom's and getting that TLC that I needed, and then the hard love that I probably yeah. got from her as well. Uh, you know, then, then it was time. I got my own place, and at the same time, when I said save my life, I meet this girl, this Italian girl, a little fireball named Michelle. And she was, I'm 30 and she's like 21. So that was definitely a difference. But we, con we connected um, as I'm going through this depression and probably, probably um, drank, was drinking a lot. I, I, I've always been in, in a drinking culture, I do believe. I, I would say, looking back and talking about it right now. Yeah, we're definitely going to talk about that. Because yeah. like you referenced earlier, it is a big part of, of Toledo culture. So we get together, and as I'm in the pain of a divorce, and you know, probably quite honest, if I had to tell you, um, there was a couple times where I thought I was going to drive off would drive myself off of the road and you know that stuff in the moment that you, yeah. you there's that song by um, you too you know you uh, got yourself stuck in a moment that you can't get out of um, I meet this beautiful girl and she saved me in those times but I did and I somehow you know you'd bring that energy into this next thing and so because yeah. I wasn't healed at all and I didn't know who the hell I was really at all anymore either but we had this beautiful thing that happened the beautiful thing also, it was with a bunch of dear friends that are still my dear friends now. But we also had some um, elements of um, darkness that we, okay. we probably experiment, we, we experimented and, and um, had my probably like, I would say, nobody really knows about this, but my hard drug phase. When I was, you know, chasing ecstasy and yeah. cocaine and things in my early 30s and um, definitely partied. and was on that scene for a little okay. while and drinking a lot. And uh, it was probably uh, just not good at all for any kind of relationship, <clears throat> especially yeah. trying to heal yourself. And um, she was young, and <clears throat> I was young. Uh, well, and the way you described the relationship as a whole and how it ended kind of sounded like something out of a, a, just a reverse love story <laughs> movie that nobody really wants to have to see somebody go through that because to be in another country and to get dumped, Jeff. So we're going, <laughs> so we're, <laughs> it's the kind of a blow to the ego to talk about it, I guess. But well, I appreciate you being willing to talk uh, about it. So we were together for like five years, bless her heart now, and, and she's a dear. We were, back then we were together for like five years and then it became like, we were supposed to, 
there was about three years of hang, me hanging on after that. So I, you know, had this little thing of called hope for a little while. And for yeah. A long, but it was just really a, a horrible time in my life. And um, so, but after we broke up, <clears throat> we were separated for probably six months or so. We were plan We had this big Europe trip yeah. uh, planned: Italy, Amsterdam, and. Um, so me and friends go over, dear friends of mine, my, two of my best friends, and they're now wives and two of my best friends. They're in these new relationships that we're going to go over there. And her and I, we went over and we thought it was going to be the, to save it. I really thought, it, ideally, uh, we're going to go to Rome and it's going to save it. But as soon as we get on the plane, there was a coldness that happened. Uh-oh. And I knew that she, we were going there and it, it, be, it was really uh, quite bittersweet, to say the least. Um, I was a, when I knew that it was done and she was cold to me the whole time. Uh, that's how she did it back there. That's how she dealt with it. And this is not a blame, like hate anybody, but. Uh, sure. At the time it was, uh, you know, I was drinking limoncello and running through the, running in the middle of the night down farm roads that I had no idea where I was at, trying to, and just ended up in a ditch in my back looking up, you know, and puking on myself, probably uh, found my way back to the hotel that, or the bed family that we were staying with, and uh, then I knew that it was done. So mm -hmm. I sucked it up in the morning with a hangover, and I told my buddies, like, take care of me, I'm gonna get through this, but right, but I'm yeah. left up right now. And, and I knew it was over then, so that was just a terrible 10 days of being mm. with this person that you're so incredibly, you know, just yeah. deeply, uh, controlled by at that time because sure. now you want and you can't eat, so you have to step back and yeah. we got back to town and that's when you know the years of hanging on were there so got through that after yeah. a number of years of a lot of darkness and the nightlife was incredible um, going out and drinking lots of Jameson and lots of yeah lots of just binge drinking and never during the day it was never about that for sure. me I'm not and it's always, you know, you go into the bar and you know, you know 100 people. The next thing you know, you got a, right. a chaser of Jameson, a proper drink of Jameson and a beer. And that was easy. Right. You did that. And then uh, the nightlife happened and I, I escaped into a lot of that. And a lot of the bars and probably a lot of questionable decisions with, you know, it's never, it was never about you know, getting laid or anything. It was, right. there was times where you could just... You just want a company. It wasn't about, you know, anything more than maybe, you know, bartenders going through the same things, you know, beautiful people that you, you spend the nights with. And it's not about, it's just about being together with somebody to, to hold, you know, to take care of some of that darkness in the middle of the night where you came home from the bar and now you're alone and the TV's on. And I don't do TV in the middle of the night anymore. Just, you know, yeah. It's blaring at you. You're trying to get any kind of rest from this life that's going on. Your hell, your world's destroyed. You're just, you know, it, 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 in your mind, it's completely up in the air. And the TV's yelling at you all night. You don't get any sleep. Yeah. You eat shitty sleep and you're drinking and you got to get up and then you eat bad food to try to feel better. You don't realize it's a vicious cycle. Then, you, right. then you're out the, the next night doing it all again. It takes its toll. And then pretty soon, you start getting over the yeah, heartbreak end of things. You know, then it becomes just... All right, I'm not. Deep, I'm not in that depth anymore. Now it's more like friends, more so. And, Definitely. Uh, well, so everything about what you've been talking about, dating back to when you initially met your college sweetheart and got married, um, I don't think it's that surprising that you followed the course that you followed because considering how you were impacted with the ending of your marriage. It sounds like Michelle was then really there for you. And I feel like when you come out of something so tumultuous, when you find that <clears throat> that emotional reprieve, you want to hold on to it and never let go. And so then that perpetuates more trauma. You felt which like you were a two-time loser. Exactly. You know, exactly. Like I lost two of these amazing women. How did I, you know, what's wrong with me? Right. I totally get that mentality. And then thinking about the nightlife piece of it, and I love that I love that you described it the way that you described it because it's not an uncommon story for most musicians in town and thinking about that what do you think about the whole idea that going through that about diving into the nightlife and and about the just the self-destructive patterns that go along with that what do you think about the idea that that is almost a rite of passage for musicians 
you can't tell people how to live their lives. Everybody's mm -hmm. going to figure out that stuff on your own. I can tell you, don't drink all the booze, and the, but I can tell you, try to leave some for other people. Yeah, you know, you're going to do, you know. <laughs> That's a good. That's a good mentality you to know, have. Yeah, you, you just. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's tough. Uh, Definitely, I think I I totally agree with you because even when I think a younger musician really respects the opinion of someone like you who's been in the scene for a long time, who's experienced this way of living and figured out that it wasn't good, it wasn't a positive addition for you. I think even in that and hearing firsthand experience from you. It is one of those things where I think someone has to decide that they don't want to experience that or they're just going to go through it and they're going to have to see for themselves. And don't get me wrong, there's two sides to that story. There's the, the, there's the um, side that's destructive, but there's also the beautiful side of it. You're yeah. out with these great people in the night and they're having charged conversations and you're all your deep friends that are now your best friends. And, yeah. Your other musician peers and stuff. So there's that end of things where it's, it's the joy of when you're in that. When you are there, that's you're forgetting. It's not like dulling the pain. It's true because you're with your true people and all sure, that stuff. But sure. at the same time, uh, you have to go home at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. So. So what was the turning point for you when you realized, man, like I, I need to st not necessarily slow down, but I need to step back and reevaluate how I'm living my life because this is this is not a permanent solution. This is not working for me. Well, my health sucked. Okay, um, it just sucked. I was carrying like an extra forty pounds and dumping dumpiness and and whiskey weight and you know my ankles sucked from an old hockey injury. It was just not easy to walk. Uh, so the booze dulled, dulled that at nighttime. You know, you sure. didn't think about that stuff. Um, Actually, give me that question again. Yeah, no problem. What was what was kind of the turning point? <laughs> the turning point. Or, yeah, for, re for realizing that yeah. the way you were living was not really serving you. Well, I got over all the heartache and stuff. So I, you know, I was having. I didn't need to have a girlfriend or person. I wasn't looking to, at all to get into a relationship. As a matter of fact, I had so many opportunities to be in a relationship. I just didn't. I didn't want to go there. I wasn't ready. Not because I was pining for some of it. It's just I just didn't need to be. Uh, I needed to be uh, take care of myself. You know, I went to Europe again with dear friends, and that was a blast. This time, I did That's it right. Good. The second time, we took our me and some very close friends, uh, including Sean LePan. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we took our guitars over to Europe, and we played all over. We played in France and in Amsterdam, and and That's awesome. And uh, we had some great moments over there came home and having a great just things are going well and next thing you know I meet Kendra yes this completely opposite of me quiet reserved shy uh, beautiful stunning woman that was somehow she came to one of my gigs I don't know if she came to one of my gigs I have to ask her about this I don't know if she was planning on me being there or not but uh, we, I stopped at her. We went to her house after a gig. It's fun to think about the idea, though, that she was definitely there to see you on purpose. <laughs> I'm going to let that be a mystery. I don't want to mess around with that. But she made me a really excellent grilled cheese Ooh, that night. Okay. And then we, um, like, Netflix and chilled, I guess. But, you know, just the, some smooching and, 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 and falling asleep to a movie, you know, yeah. whatever that means. And the next thing you know, 11 years has gone by here. She's my fiance and um, she has saved my life because she was the decision that I made. Love is a choice. And so yeah. it's going out every night. There's choices that we make as we get older. And I knew that- um, That's a really good way to look at it, actually. I couldn't be out there and be with, you, you can't do both. You mm -hmm. can be both together That's if you're true. out there, but still you take the energy from that you're bringing home with you and mm -hmm. everything. So. When I when we moved in together, I, I, when I put, I had a sweet place in uh, South Toledo. You know, a great rock and roll bachelor yeah. pad. We, we yes. wrote our song there. Yes. You know, and giving up that freedom, if you will, to coexist with somebody that you want to. That was um, kind of the turning point, I would say, because after gigs, I was actually having anxiety. I would have to drive around. I'd drive downtown, look at the bars, because yeah. usually I would go into the bars after a gig. Meet my friends. Meet, try to maybe meet, I'd meet. Maybe there, 
not necessarily looking for love at the time, but at the yeah. same time, maybe there was somebody that was going to be my uh, my love or that would love me. <clears throat> you know, I'm thinking about what I said earlier. I'm like, maybe I always wanted something. I always you want love, you know? Absolutely. <clears throat> but um, that shirt that changed because. I had, I had anxiety not being in the bars. I, mm -hmm. We knew everybody. I could go any That's part true. of the city and I knew all the bartenders. You knew because he's like these long years of relations. And the next thing you know, you've got a drink in your hand and you're drinking. Next thing you know, you're drinking. Mm -hmm. It's late night again. And the next thing you know, you're coming back home drunk to your, uh, or at least in a, you know, to pass out by your woman's side in her bed. And then you feel <laughs> shitty the next day because you're hungover. And, you know, it's, it's really not conducive to, uh, I don't think it's conducive to anything. If you if your yeah. brain's not there, you're dull, and you're you, you feel like just being on the couch. I can't, that's not that's no way to live. Because not because you want to be on the couch, but because you physically can't get off the couch. Right. And that charges into the the depression, which just pins you down. It can paralyze you and all that stuff. So, so I made the decisions to get to not go to the bar so much, and then be, we started becoming a family. So, what advice would you give to a budding performer? that it's just starting to get into the scene to help them, give give them a little insight about how to avoid some of these common pitfalls that you see a lot of us coming into the scene experience. I don't really have any advice, Ashley. I don't know. I think that you just don't try to be in the, on the scene. Don't try mm -hmm. to be in anything scene. There, there, there's always going to be the new hot things coming. There's always going to be the new awesome place to play at that everybody has to play and, and those places come and go be consistent with yourself do the work you're going to be you're going to be out and the night does bring things the nighttime does bring other things that the daytime doesn't yeah so just be aware and meaning this you have a good time you have a great time but just remember that you have to also make good decisions and yeah. you have to be responsible for the decisions that you do make and sometimes the nightlife makes you do dumbass things, you know. That and, is very uh, true. Not because you're a bad person. It's just because you know, shit just happens when you get too much booze in you sometimes. That's you know? very true. But, you know, be aware. Have a good time. But don't, uh, it doesn't have to define you. It doesn't That's have to define advice. you. You know, you can, you're other things too. You know, the money that you're making from your gig is taking care of maybe to help you uh, by recording time. Maybe some more gear. Maybe taking care of your rent. So you know you have to. You can't be a party guy all the time, can you? Right. If you party all the time and all that stuff, and if you're drinking all the time too, try to play your guitar a little bit and see how you think you're great, you know. But no, <laughs> your facilities uh, diminish. And um, yes, most you know, definitely. And then <clears throat> there's people that have the I call them the Jekyll and the high drinkers. Mm. The people that once they turn to a point, they get the blackout kind of deal. Mm -hmm. They become that other person that nobody wants to be around. Right. Separate, completely, the other, their other personality's gone. I was never that way. I was always more just, more, hey, you know, I yeah. got more <laughs> loving, if anything, maybe a little more crooked, but I could walk that way, because I was so used to, you know, my blood was thick with the Jameson and with all that stuff. And, and, and uh, now, I never wanted to quit. I never thought I had to quit because I never had any shakes for the booze at all. It was never about that. Yeah. I never, uh, I can look at everybody in the eye about that. Sure. It, it's just, it was, uh, I, I, I missed too many regrets wise. I missed, or I got to parties, family functions three hours late because I had to sleep off a hangover or something. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. Yeah. You can't get those hours back. Spending time with your mom mm. for a few extra hours because you, know, you were hungover. Um, that is good advice. Nowadays, yeah. Ash, when we haul at the moon, I still, I don't know what you're, you, you would quit for quite a while. Yeah, I took, I took a three year solid break and I would recommend it to absolutely anybody because I think when, when you are in the music environment, the nightlife environment for so long, it is like you were saying, it's so normal for everybody to kind of be doing it at, at a rate that is definitely excessive, that that becomes the norm. So I do not regret for a second taking a solid three-year break from that. What have you learned when you come back? Do you binge ever still? Um, there have been a couple occasions, yes, but for the most part, because I removed it from my life for so long, my body and my brain is so <laughs> acutely aware. Isn't that crazy? When, yeah, yeah. It, it, I feel like overall I'm just, uh, it's turned me into a much more mindful individual and I know that I do not like that out of control feeling 
And so for me, I know this doesn't work for, for everyone because yes. some people legitimately need to cut That's it right. out, say goodbye and never look back at it again. Indeed. But it's just made me realize that um, I, I love the performer that I am, the, the person that I am <laughs> way more when that is not, when I'm not relying on that to lead my personality. So, so I would recommend to anyone who, especially in the music arts community who feels like maybe it's not necessarily an all encompassing issue, but that it is getting in the way of their life and that maybe they could be a little bit sharper to step away from it for, for just just a, a period of time. I would recommend it's, that to anyone. It's really important to step away from that stuff and, and get yeah. some perspective. Um, I use the word binge, and I don't want to use that in a, um, like, <clears throat> I think I'm more just drinking in excess of using yes. something beyond the point. Having more than a couple, exactly. couple drinks. Exactly. Yes. You know, exactly. next thing you know, you get, you're oh shit, and you're on your third shot. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be hungover probably. Yeah, I think and for me now, I will when I do have things, it's it's actually taking a moment to consider how they taste, and and actually enjoying them, Delicious, and less the about way. trying to put away as much of it as you possibly can in the shortest period of time to quell social anxiety or just generally because there are impulsivity issues there. So I think generally being more mindful is always a good thing. It is a good thing. And the main thing is we can't afford to lose any more hours of the day. Yeah. I mean, with feeling, it's really the brown bottle flu is, you know what mm -hmm. it is. It just, I, I get in bed. I get hangovers bad physically and mentally. That was me too. I got tired of the day after it's, it's completely wasted, wasted. because even if, I wasn't physically feeling sick, my anxiety would be peaked to a point where basically I'm paralyzed for that day. So once again, the day's lost no matter yeah. what. And did, did you find that when you were there and then did you eat crap? Oh my gosh, feel better, yes. Es especially when I was playing with my band and, and we were playing until two o'clock in the morning, we would be at the bar till 3, 30, 4 o'clock. Then you're pulling through fast food. Pocket full of cash, I better, better go get Pocket full of cash, Exa exactly. And you're not even for a second think thinking, it's, it's that there's there's nothing mindful to it. Your your brain and and, and your overall um, you conscious right presence yeah, is not yeah. in there. Yes, exactly, exactly. It, but I think that goes back to for me. You know, I could have all the people in the world have told me that that was going to be the trajectory of that, but I don't like to be told what to do. So I had to figure that out for myself. You know what I, I mean? I do know exactly what you mean. <laughs> So moving out of the nightlife and looking at one of my favorite aspects of who you are, Jeff Stewart, the songwriter, I have so much, so much affection thinking about that part of who you are because I've gotten to experience that, thinking about getting to co-write with you for my album. And the way that I view your co-writing style, I learned a lot from you in that session. I was so nervous going into it, but it, it was moments into being there with you. And I think it's because your style reminds me a lot of how Jeff Tweedy from Wilco co-writes with people. I just read his book. Did you, isn't it amazing? <laughs> where he literally is sitting down across from the person and having a great conversation and not conversing for the sake of writing, <laughs> but conversing and having a natural conversation about what's going on in your lives. And then from that comes the creativity. And I learned so much from that. So. So You're listening, aren't you? Yes. We're, li we're listening. Yes. We're yes. listening deep, deep, intensely as songwriters. Exactly. We're keyed in, not just be because we're songwriters, but yeah. because we're, we care. We care because we're not here together wasting our time. Right, and not just not just listening to look for a hook or or a great piece of lyric, but really, really listening so that you can truly get to the heart and the emotion. That's what I mean. The of listening, it. the listening happens, and then the by byproduct, mishearing something. Uh, when you're done with a conversation and we want to pick our guitars up to, to write a song, we have something to think about. We have, hey, you yeah. just said you said earlier something about uh, you know, drink until 3 a.m. and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Next thing you're rhyming 3 a.m. And you yeah. know, and we got a little melody going. And, uh, I think when we when we sat down and we, we co-wrote the song for my album, we literally just had this awesome natural conversation about what the music community, the people in our community mean to me and mean That's to right. you and collectively put putting those thoughts together and referencing that conversation we had. You told me you wanted to write a song. Yeah. You wanted to do it. You wanted to sum up how you felt about people that cared about you in the music community. Yeah, absolutely. Did you, uh, you wanted to send something back to them. That's how we started that. Definitely. And we got three good verses out of, uh, metaphors out of thinking about our friends. We certainly you know, did. And a good melody. So thinking about 
Obviously, the process for co-writing is going to be different than a, one's private individual process. So I'm very interested to know when you are diving into songwriting, what does your creative process look like from idea conception to finalizing the piece? Because I know I've seen you actively in studio sometimes finishing a piece. So what does it look like for you from the time you, you get the idea until you complete it? There's definitely many different uh formats to that question because it doesn't help it doesn't happen uh there's no schedule for it yeah but it's my work it's my passion i love to get tinker at it it's fit wrenching on your car you're wrenching on a song yeah you have songs that sometimes they you you're in the, you're doing something the next thing you, you get a melody or you hear something and you get a little melody line like oh i gotta go write that down so usually what i try to do is now that i'm here i'm here so yeah. let's let's see if we can let's see how far we can go. Let me see how far I can get with this song. And then you get, might get stuck. You might be thinking about two other things you're working on at the same time. But uh, and, and working on what am I trying to write here subconsciously? Yeah. And what am I trying? What am I saying? And what's this about? Uh, so you you have to facilitate the song. Um, so I just come back to it all the time. If it's not done yet, I'll come back to it. I think about it. Kendra, I'm not, this is not a Tweety comparison, but I, Kendra was saying that she, when she read the book, she was very, she said it would remind me of him a lot in terms of just the process and all the stuff. Definitely. Some of this mental stuff that you think about that everybody else isn't thinking about, but you are way overthinking. And the different, ang the different, just the process, it's real. Definitely. Uh, and so, trying to, format one specific way is not it sure. doesn't do you don't do it that way sometimes like when i'm with ryan roth and fish you know uh we might i might say hey you guys talked about this you guys were talking about this or you said red-tailed hawk and, you know some images and stuff like that yeah and then, so these guys are word craftsmen so i i love taking i love taking the notes taking notes and throwing ideas out there let them bounce and let them run with it and then i'll write it down i happen to be this is not a brag, I just happen to be good at writing melodies. I can write a hundred songs a day, are. probably with just melodies, and uh, it's, it's just from the work. I, I just, I can do that. It's easy, it comes easy to me. You know, we, I can tell because when you came into studio with me for us to finish up the song, we had singers there to, to do that choir part on the song, and you and I were actively finishing up writing the bridge, and you came up with that awesome melody for the bridge on the spot. We were sitting in the vocal booth, and I still have this this picture of you that I fondly look at where you're sitting there on a stool with your notebook and you're actively writing. And so I would I would totally agree with you. I don't think it's a braggy moment for you so much as it's a fact. You are very good at coming up with melodies. That's what I love to do. And I, and you know what? It's usually the first melody that I, that I come up with, that's the one. I don't really stray from it too often. Wow. Like if I, the melody that we came up with right away was the one we used. Yeah, Did it was it was exactly like that. Maybe some phrasing here or there. But really, we didn't we didn't change the melody once it was set. Because there's something about that initial melody that sparks you, and you know, it develops a little bit. But for the most part, that's your original thought, and it's like art in the moment. And then I've been quickly recording these things. And, you know, I have a full time recording studio, uh, a full time. That's a whole another story. But yeah, um, you get to get these ideas down quickly. You don't have too much time to think about it. It's like you go to the store and you, sure. hey, what, what's the wall color going to be? Let's pick the wall color. And then you're going to live with that. And you, pick, <laughs> yeah. you live with those decisions, but it's inspired by the moment Absolutely. Uh, of the process. So let's talk about how you kind of shifted more recently, how you're choosing to endeavor your recording process. Because up until more recently, I've known you to go into the studio and record a full album at a single studio. And that's been it. But you kind of shifted your approach and rather than going in recording a, a an album in its entirety at a single studio, you've adopted this really cool process of recording at multiple studios, which then gives you the different aesthetics from those different studios. And inadvertently, when trying to just release singles, have ended up co coming up with four full albums of material. So what made you decide to shift your methodology and how you choose to record and release? And how have you been enjoying that shift? It's, that is a very, there's a very specific answer to that, I would say. Yeah. So before, when we talked about how when you're done with the album, then you kind of get that postpartum depression. An album takes a lot of work. 
it takes it, a couple years or at least a year yeah. to, of your full time. Uh, uh, you, it, it needs you. <laughs> you have to mm -hmm. take care of it. So what happens when you'd be done with an album, then you would get depressed and oh, I got to start all over again. You know, I wanted to, there's, you miss that time, that feeling that, that you're with, you know, there's a, uh, we had some good times making that. There was a lot of energy that went into that. So now it's done. Okay, what am I going to do now? Right. Even though there's stuff to do, you just don't think about it that way. So I decided right before COVID, I was going to stop doing albums, not focus on albums, but just focus on singles. That way I can release a single and still be relevant and not let two or three years pass before I have anything out and still put stuff out. Yeah. And then still maybe, so when I had, I can get that gratification and then start working on the next one as a new thing um, to try to get away from that depression into things or whatever, you know. So I'm gonna keep making singles. Next thing you know, I'm working in all these different studios with my greatest friends but I've got four different albums now. Not just one that I was bef talking about just getting rid of before. Right. Now <laughs> I've got four albums. What does that mean? At least 40 songs per album or per, per you know, 10 a piece, if that's your even minimal. Right. You have to, and then you have to write the ones that aren't written yet. The ones that are, have to be the collection. So I'm wrangling like 60 songs right now that are with me every day that I have to go into these guys. I have to have a finished product or you can't record it. Right. So now it's became, I was telling Kendra this, it's like, it, I didn't realize how dark I was getting encompassed with it and out of touch. Uh, and I was not there sometimes because I was always here with all these things. It was like, it became really, take that one album, multiply it by four. Yeah. And then it became that. And now it's there. So I'm trying, the one I said, shed my skin and reinvent. I need, I'm working on figuring out how to do these four albums and still release singles and be relevant, but, and then not be, you know, well, that this one's more country or this one's more psychedelic or, or more rock. You also have to fight those perceptions. Cause you know, I'm not a right. one trick pony in that way. I have, I have a lot of different angles of, of music that I put out, so. Well, and you also know that one of the hardest things for any musician is to pigeonhole themselves into a specific genre to self-describe. So especially when you have Hardest multiple question. albums working with multiple different genres, that becomes even more difficult to define yourself down. Describe your music. You know you what? Know? It's the hardest thing in the world. Like I will jokingly say, well, it's like singer, songwriter, pop with a Broadway classical flair to it. But I really don't know how to fully pin pigeonhole it down because it's not what one would think of top 40 pop, but it's also kind of modeled after that stereotypical radio format while also dipping into some deeper things. and. Aaron, Aaron Rudder pointed out, you, you kind of have like a classical bent to your stuff and it <laughs> probably is reflective of, you know, my what I like to listen to, but I think it's really, really hard as an artist to to fully define what your style is or your genre is because other people usually do that for you. You can't control what people think about. No, you what really can't. So you just have to do it. And, <laughs> and you brought up, uh, you know, Rudder. Aaron, yeah. he's, he's played on uh, about so far, three of my new songs. Isn't he incredible? He, that's why I call him. Yeah. He's he, first. He's a great guy to work with. He's he easy really is. as a person. He, he's a humble person, and he's his intonation is so perfect. And he's a melodic player. He, he really understands is. the song. He, he's mm -hmm. there for the song to serve it. And he's a worker in the studio. He's a grinder. Very much so. He's a grinder, yeah. isn't he? Oh, uh, very much so. And he then, does the work prior to coming in. So when he comes in, he's ready and, and he's It's funny you brought that up. Cause a couple times I sent him a couple things to listen to, to prior, <laughs> and then he had ideas. But the first couple, the first two, I was like, I'm not gonna, I don't want you to listen to it. I just want you to come in and figure out the moment, you know? Yeah. Which, cause he wasn't, it wasn't based on chord structure. He was playing some different sections of things, you know? So I like that end of things, but also mm -hmm. he likes the prep work. Yes, and he I does. Appreci I appreciate that. So, Me too. you know, <laughs> I, that's a learning experience for me too. Sometimes you assume that, like I have uh, my friend Chris Shutters is coming into the studio tomorrow yeah. to okay. record uh, a yeah. flute part. And to, I want him to play a solo on this one track. And he, uh, I, I didn't send him the song. I want him to be in the moment for something like that. That but makes sense. I don't know, man. It's, uh, <laughs> it really is. So I want to talk to you for a second about the concept of self-promotion and imposter syndrome. 
because I've I'm noticed the worst at it. I've noticed a recurring theme with quite a few of us in town that um, a lot of us deal with imposter syndrome, but even more than that, we deal with the icky part of, of self-promotion where you almost feel egotistical to be putting your stuff yes. out and, and self-flagellating. Doesn't it? it? It's an icky, icky thing. What do you so, mean? So go ahead, you used yeah. the word, the word uh, mm -hmm. what the hell was the word you just imposter used? Imposter syndrome. Yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, we're kind of thinking of, of the whole concept of even though you're qualified to do what you do, you have many, many years under your belt doing it. Sometimes you still sit there and are like, who am I to have the notoriety that I have or to have the following that I have? And once again, who am I? So who really cares about what I have to say? And I think no matter how confident of a person that you are or how long you've been doing it, I think all of us go through the, the whole imposter syndrome on a certain level. Then you couple self-promotion with it. And if you already are sometimes feeling like, man, I, I should not have the voice that I have to the level that I have and then add social media into it and thinking about the fact that, wow, now I'm supposed to tell everybody how great I am because you are such a humble person oh and you God. like your work to speak for itself. It's so funny, there's a condition, it's a condition. That's why I asked you like, what is the, this is a thing, it's really yes, a it's thing? Yes, it's a real thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, it I'm is intrigued. a real thing. I'm yes, yes, it, it, and it, um, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk, whether you are a local Toledo musician or I've heard people who are on a national scale talk about this, um, amazing Broadway artist Lin-Manuel Miranda has mm -hmm. talked about imposter syndrome before. So it happens to all sorts of people. So is that something that you find yourself struggling with sometimes? Yeah. And especially putting in the self-promotion piece of it, is that difficult for you to say, hey, look at this thing that I did, yeah. it's incredible, you should like it too. No, it's it's really, it's hard on me. I beat myself up about it. And I watch other people, then you get into that suck hole of like, watching these other people being so great about it and then you're not doing it, you're just wasting your own time. Mm -hmm. It's just such a time waster. And I see these people sharing everything, but not just like their opinions and thoughts and the bad stuff, but mostly like about life and, the, and processes, life processes, creative processes. And I'm like, I'm interested in that. Why wouldn't these people that care about me be interested in that too? Right. And then you don't do it and then it becomes a thing. You know, those things become lists and then you have to get to them. And, uh, it's not comfortable promoting yourself. I can share every day. I'm lucky with a lot of things. I have dear friends. I can share experiences. I take a lot of selfies with people because I, I care about my friends a lot. I love know? that you will elaborate too when you post a selfie with someone else about who the person is to you and, and what they mean to you. Thank you. You're I'm welcome. glad because I, I didn't know how to, I kind of dropped off. I started, I stopped yelling or stopped being so active on the Facebook stuff and kind of really withdrew. Uh, just got tired of being out there. And then- I understand Then that. it became like a thing, then COVID all happened and you know, this, this things were always weird and, uh, but now I feel like I can't, I just don't have, I have so many years of things that I wanted to share, accomplishments that I, you know, I was a member of the Hall, Star High School Hall of Fame that I got inducted yeah. into. It was a big deal to start. I took it, I went there, I went to the gig, I went to that thing hungover, and my mom did, and I was like, didn't take it seriously at all. I walked into this big black tie gala. These people were in tuxedos, and I'm walking into this big thing, like, these people are taking this very seriously, yeah. and I didn't at all, because I was like, oh, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm not, right. don't, I don't deserve anything like these real people do. I'm just a damn singer and a draw, a tie paint, you know? I didn't have a speech prepped for that. I don't like watching. I might. I probably won't watch this. <laughs> Somehow that doesn't surprise super me. Super not comfortable with all that stuff. You yeah. know, I, I don't need to see myself yak. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but just the. Um, I'm completely getting out track right now, actually, with self promoting. That's, it's, that's okay. It's, it, it's in my brain so much. Uh, I think it's time to share because I, I mm -hmm. like saying about that. I didn't tell anybody about that, but it's something to be proud of. It's not like you're going. Look at me, you suck, I have this. It's not, I wanna, you don't want them to see the one, just the one side of you that you're this. You want to share the other things too, but then once you do that, then you're out there. And uh, I'm trying to learn how to be out there and be comfortable in my skin being sure. out there. So that's, I think what I mean by reinvention. I'm also not dying my, uh, my mom's white hair, uh, Elvis Black anymore. Sure. <laughs> So there's there's a time to maybe, you know, 
uh, reinvention of everything, of, of uh, this stuff's so far in my brain that I literally yeah. start thinking, I get so, you get really sidetracked by your own thoughts. I it very much focus, get that. The focus is, um, you know, I talked about that, keeping each other on track and focus. Mm -hmm. I totally. You start thinking about this shit. You really do. <laughs> You're like, hey. You really do. I, I have to say, I think you and I could probably have like a four-hour conversation about all of this because you're such a you're such a, a key person in in Toledo. However, you see yourself in your place here, um, you are you are deeply loved and deeply respected. I I know that that extensive compliments for you are very difficult, but I want to let you know seriously on a personal level, you have been such an incredible role model and example to me of how to move through um, life gracefully as a performer and and giving me so much advice on songwriting. And I just appreciate your friendship and, and who you are as a person. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much for doing this. Are we done? You're, we we are done with the interview portion. We could probably do I an entire I felt like we have been talking other... for like 30 seconds. I know, right? Isn't yeah. that crazy? We may, I feel like next season or another season, we may end up having to do a second one because there's so much more ground to cover with you. But thank you so much for being so vulnerable and for so just for being so awesome. If you could just look right at this camera, tell people where they can find you on social media and what projects you're working on and excited about that you want to let people know about. I'm excited for you all to hear all this new music that I've been working on um, diligently and excitedly and, and uh, mentally. Um, I've got a cool show coming up. Um, my, one of my best mates, Jake Kluski, uh, is putting on uh, a listening experience at Levi and Lilacs. July 12th, I'm playing uh, an intimate show, gonna be doing all my music, my catalog, first set, and then new songs, uh, just me and my guitar, an intimate show, kind of like the ARC listening room experience. I have music on Spotify, uh, my catalog's on there, new music's on there. I've been making videos, and I encourage you to check out YouTube uh, and see what I've got cooking. Awesome. Thank you so much to all of you for continuing to tune in and listening on our audio streaming platforms on Spotify and Apple, and also for watching the video formats on Facebook and YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. And if you're not already following us on social media, you can find us on all platforms at Heart of Glass the Pod. Please stick around after this for a preview of next week's episode. And thank you for tuning in again to once again learn a little bit more on a deeper level about another human that makes up the heartbeat of the Glass City. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time. Um, most recent, well, there's two most recent, um, the story of Faith, our yes. blind dachshund. Oh, my gosh. Yes, please talk about Faith. So she, she came in, trying to make a long story, not so long. She came in in... The winter, some kids found her. Um, it was snowing, and her eyes were all jacked up. Uh, we had to have one eye removed and had to fix the other eye, and she was with us for like eight months, seven months, and now she uh, she she lives above um, the original sub shop with Mo. I love that so much. Um, what a great and I, story. And she calls her something else. I don't remember what she calls her, fish stick or something. She still calls her fish.